Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Susan Warner, and I'm Curator of Education here at the Museum of Glass. Thank you for being here on this wonderful occasion. We are celebrating the exhibition, René Lelique, Art, Art Deco Gems, from the Stephen and Rosalind Sh um, Shulman Collection. Thank you so much for your... <laughs> The um, exhibition has been enjoyed by so many people. And we also have our curator for the exhibition, Katie Buckingham, here. And Katie will be giving us a brief tour of the exhibition after the talk. I am so pleased to introduce to you Nick Dawes, who's Senior Vice President of Special Collections at Heritage Aucus Auctions. It's a real honor for us to have Nick here. He is regarded as the country's leading expert on René Lalique, and that is a, a nomination given to him by the Corning Museum of Glass, our sister organization. Nick began his career in his native England and brings over 40 years of experience in the antique and fine art auction business. He emigrated to New York in 1979 and has pursued his career there as an auctioneer, appraiser, author, lecturer, and antiques dealer. Nick is also former department head and auctioneer at Phillips and Sotheby's. Nick is the author of four standard works on decorative arts. Together with scores of articles and lectures widely, given widely internationally, he has been a faculty member of Parsons School of Design since 1984 and has taught marketing at Columbia Business School and courses on English and French furniture at Bard Graduate Center. Nick is also active in many charitable organizations and as chairman and CEO of the Salamundi, the oldest artist club in New York City, founded in 1871. He first appeared as an appraiser on Antiques Roadshow for PBS in the second ever broadcast of the exit of this show and appeared regularly ever since discussing ceramics, glass, silver, and uh, other decorative arts. So on behalf of the Museum of Glass staff, board, and volunteers, let's welcome Nick Dawes. We're so excited to hear his talk. Thank you so much, Nick. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. I'd like to thank Susan Warner uh, for inviting me here and all of the excellent staff here at the Museum of Glass for making me feel so welcome. And, and I will certainly add my thanks to <clears throat> Stephen and Roz Shulman, old friends of mine, for their highly significant and generous gift to the museum. I know that many of you here today are members of the museum and supporting uh, your museum that way. You have a jewel of a museum here. If you're not a member, please become one. And if you are, please support the museum uh, as much as you can. I, two things before I start really talking to you about Lalique. I, I, brought a, I like to carry Lalique with me. So I brought a little object with me that I'm going to pass around. I'll ask Susan, who is a professional curator Can you hear me better now? On the back row? Very good. Um, I've asked Susan to pass around a little object, which says a great deal about René Lalique. And I'm talking today about not just the art of René Lalique, but I'll use the art of René Lalique and the story of it for a talk about collecting the art of René Lalique, something that the Shulmans know very well, I, I will tell you that there are two great collections of the work of René Lalique in US museums. One is here with you, and the other is in the Corning Museum of Glass on the East Coast. And you have the best one. <laughs> uh, 
Now, of course, when I'm lecturing at Corning, I tell them they have the best book. By the way, I'll be sipping water out of this remarkably made glass that, that was just presented to me to use today, made in the hot shop. If you haven't visited the hot shop, what a fabulous resource that is that you have. So please do that. Um, there's nothing I like better, really, than having the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And um, by the way, I just want to make sure I know how to forward this. I think I do. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the art of René Lalique, telling the story of it, and pausing from time to time to talk about the concept of collecting the art of René Lalique, which is something I've seen throughout my career. It didn't really begin until the 1970s. Prior to that, collecting any decorative arts of the earlier 20th century was rather rare. Um, but people didn't pay attention. But they started doing so in the, in the 1970s and have been actively and avidly doing so ever since. I, I like to think of René Lalique as perhaps a, um, one of the shadowy characters in the back of this painting. This is uh, by Gustave Caible. Uh, it's the pride of the, <coughs> um, the uh, <coughs> museum in Chicago. And it was painted when René Lalique was 18. And perhaps he's scurrying off toward the Gare du Nord on his way to London, where he spends the next two years studying uh, at a college in London. He was born in 1860 and died in 1945. And if you know anything of the history of art through those years, it's the period that sees the entire what we call modern movement born and grow to maturity at the time of René Lalique's very early childhood. There was really only one style of art, uh, that which you learned in an academy, the academic style. But certainly by the time he's 18 and entering his formative years, we see in Paris Impressionism beginning, uh, Japonism, and there's a succession of artistic movements, post-Impressionism, Fauvism, Cubism and ultimately Expressionism. And by the time of René Lalique's death, you have Jackson Pollock wandering around drunk. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Is that better? Everyone can hear me? Um, Jackson Pollock dripping house paint onto a canvas. And basically all the barriers imposed by traditions in fine art, in painting at least, have been addressed and broken. And there's a parallel series of developments within the decorative arts, which René Lalique was always on the front line of. He was a protagonist, always doing something different, something progressive. But imagine Paris in 1878, when this was painted. It's the Paris, I think, that we all want to visit now, but of course it's long gone. It's the Paris that's poised on the edge of a very, very, very modern time. And for the rest of the century, Paris really experiences two artistic movements. First of all, the Art Nouveau, the progressive movement, which René Lalique was very much a part of. And secondly, um, a parallel movement that we call fin de siècle, a movement that is not so much progressive, is dedicated to doing things historically, to reviving historical taste in architecture and um, in decorative arts and, and uh, all related art movements. But a fascinating time because René Lalique as a young man was able to see all of the historical styles presented by something like, I don't know, the Paris Opera House that was completed when he was 16 years old, he would have seen it being built. And all of the Beaux-Arts ornamentation that goes with it, there's a bit of everything in there. And he would also have grown into the burgeoning, the fledgling Art Nouveau movement and learned from that. And of course, from the exposure to the very new art of Japan. So all of these movements were essential in Lalique's formative years. And, you know, we know Lalique today, and here we are in a museum of glass associated with glass making. 
But in fact, René Lalique did not begin designing and manufacturing glass commercially until he was about 50 years old. And when you think of the vast legacy, much of which you can see in the galleries outside, of glass design that he has left us, um, it's just remarkable. And I think also rather encouraging if you're about 50 and thinking, what else can I do? But he was, through his first career, a jeweler, not just any jeweler, but by the time um, at the pinnacle of his jewelry making career, when he was in his early 40s, he was really the top jeweler in Paris, certainly the most fashionable jeweler in Paris, which effectively made him the most chic and fashionable and elegant jeweler in the world at the time. And he could very easily have lived the rest of his life and times as an elegant Parisian jeweler, not a bad life. But being a progressive individual, that wasn't good enough for him. He wanted to face new challenges. But I I show you this, uh, which is a hair ornament, the kind of thing that would have been very chic in 1900, carved out of horn to give you an idea of the quality of René Lalique's jewelry. Something that is way beyond, in my opinion, not only anything that anyone's made since, but anything that anyone made prior to him, back to and including the Renaissance. I think that René Lalique was by far the most talented jeweler of all time. And not just as a designer. He was capable of making these things, too. He learned all of the tools of the trade uh, as a young apprentice in Paris. <clears throat> but what he's done here, and you see these hair ornaments, you know, and typically it's a prong made out of metal or two, double prong with an ornamental device on the top, a flower or something. René Lalique has made the wings of the swallows. He's extended them in, a, in what I call modern mannerism to become the prongs of the design. This is immensely advanced design work. And really, only he could think of and do that. This is carved from a piece of horn. Horn has different layers of color to it. So as you carve it down, rather like a cameo, it takes on this perspective. And horn also is an organic material. It tends to return to a form as sort of warps. So he has addressed that by putting that silver bar across the top. It's a little piece of, you know, a piece of grass that the swallow has picked up as it's building a nest. Um, but it's there for a reason. It strengthens the whole thing, you see. This is genius in terms of jewelry design. And what is it? It's a pair of swallows meeting in midair. It, it, it is a millisecond of time that René Lalique has captured and frozen in time and given us uh, in perpetuity. Here are two portraits of René Lalique. The, the, the photograph taken in 1903 in his new premises in Paris, just opened <clears throat> and still there. You can see he's, he's 42, 43 years old. He's, a, he, he's an assiduous, elegant jeweler in Paris. The other portrait is taken when he's, he's about my age. He's 65, 66 years old. He's a little tubbier. He's a little grayer. He's wearing glasses. Uh, all of these things happen to you as you enter the 60s. And <clears throat> he's, um, he's at the pinnacle of his career as a glassmaker. Both of these portraits were taken shortly after a great success in his career, in the photograph, he's coming off the successes of the Paris exhibition of 1900, which was a huge hit for La Ligue. And in the painting, which was done, by the way, by his daughter, Suzanne La Ligue, he's fresh from the 1925 Paris exhibition, the next great exhibition, in fact, in Paris after 1900, where he is. Um, He's established himself as the, the world's leading modern glassmaker. But in both of these portraits, even though he has two different careers, he's doing the same thing. Arguably, what he did best, and certainly what he did most of in his career, he's drawing. He was an incessant drawer. He was an immensely talented drawer. You can see some of uh, René Lalique's original drawings 
in various places. They are exquisite in terms of their graphic art. Uh, there's a little book that I read recently published by the Musée d'Orsay, which is um, a series of letters that René Lalique wrote to his uh, future wife, uh, mostly in the late 1890s until about 1906 or 7, uh, from when he's away from Paris. And he writes in several of them at the end. He's in a, a room in London or something, and he says... Um, I have to sign off now, the light is fading, and I have to draw the, the morning glory outside my window. You know, he's, he just cannot stop drawing things. He loves it, as you can see in these, these two portraits. And many of the drawings are of flora and fauna, which are the, the uh, primary elements in René Lodig's design work, jewelry and glass. You'll see outside in the Shulman collection um, a couple of bronze objects. We're not entirely sure what they are. They're casts of natural and, in one case, supernatural object. One is a cast of a flower. And uh, we believe that his brother-in-law, Auguste Ledru, who was a sculptor, made these. And they were used in Lalique's studio as kind of exhibits to copy. You know, you can't put a flower in there for very long. Um, but you can put a bronze flower in there for a long time, and you can work on it and over and over. And you'll see these reproduced in various forms of, of um, floral jewelry and later on in floral uh, glass. He liked exotic flora to some extent. Um, he visited the Jardin Botanique in Paris, one of which a large um, greenhouse was actually right outside right across the street from his studio so he had great access to it and he he would pick on orchids and lilies and things like that the sort of languid flowers as the Arnivaux designers called them but <clears throat> and these came in handy for some of his uh, theatrical clients uh, people like Sarah Bernard and uh, Leanne de Pougy they liked big impressive floral pectoral ornaments like this one which looked good on stage, or perhaps on their heads. It's that same ornament again, kind of replicated to some degree in René Lalique's first letterhead from the mid-1890s. Another hair comb. But he also liked what you might call ordinary fauna, uh, flora. He liked, he liked weeds, frankly, um, like dandelions. And, and why not? Why is a dandelion not as beautiful as an orchid or another flower? René Lalique certainly felt so and, and would uh, make the... I've got to move this, it's slipping. And the dandelions um, become part of his repertoire and other weeds, if you like. Here's a drawing which is not a botanical drawing. It's really a drawing for an object. And here is the, here's an object made in gold for the pin, for the hair ornament, and it's glass. It's casting glass. He begins casting small glass elements. As early as the 1890s, in his studio, you could basically he's doing it in a kind of studio level, kind of homegrown glass kiln. He liked moths, too. I've, I've always thought that the moth is to the butterfly kind of as the weed is to the flower. You know, it's the poor relation. But they're equally beautiful in many ways. And if you've ever, is a drawing of a, a moth. If you've ever seen a, at night, you know, when you have your lights on and the moth goes splat on the window. On the window. I think Lalique saw that and this is exactly what he's, he's copying. He loves the symmetry of it. Unlike something like an orchid or a lily, all fauna is symmetrical. You know, we are symmetrical. And he loves symmetry, René Lalique, throughout the majority of his career. It's only a very brief period, in fact, in the 1890s, that we see him kind of flirting with asymmetrical flora. Here he is giving a floral jewel to his wife-to-be. And that, that's a photograph by René Lalique 
uh, of a chateau that his first wife actually owned and he kind of inherited through her. I've been there. It's in a, a place called Clairefontaine near Rambouillet outside of Paris. And if you know the, the French novel um, by Alain Fournier, this is, this is the lost domain, you know? It's a very, very private, very old, and very secret place. And Lalique uh, took photographs there. He was something of a pioneer photographer. Here's one uh, taken at the chateau in Clairefontaine of the lake there with swans on it. Swans become a favorite part of, again, his design repertoire. When I was a dealer many years ago, I bought this drawing at an auction in Paris. And I didn't know what it was at the time. I thought it was for what the French call a collier de chien, like a, like a necklace that you put around like that. It's a beautiful drawing. And then, and then I found this. And of course, it's a drawing for a ring. And, and how better to design a ring than as a band? And you give that drawing to the workmasters. And, and they go ahead and make it. And Swan stayed with René Lalique throughout his career. Here's a, here's a well-known design uh, from Lalique, the two swans swimming on a, on a mirrored lake, if you like. I believe this was the last design that René Lalique created. It's typically as attributed to his son, Marc Lalique, because it was only made after World War II, made after René Lalique had died. But it was designed according to the catalogue resume in 1944 or 45, and I believe that he had a great deal to do with it. It certainly relates very closely to his uh, treatment of swans in other, in other forms, including this rather beautiful pendant. Um, <clears throat> another photograph by René Lalique. This is one of those weird trees that only seem to grow in France. And René Lalique loved the tree, but of course, being Lalique, he saw some kind of creature living in it. It's a mythical um, tree-dwelling nymph of some sort and made this pendant from it. Collecting Lalique jewelry, by the way, um, is not easy, uh, as the Shulmans will tell you. Um, you know, the <clears throat> to try and find more than a handful of pieces over a decade is difficult. They are extremely hard to come by. All the great ones are in museums, and if you own one, it's very rarely that you sell it. So <clears throat> collecting glass is a much more um, bankable option. But here's the pendant, typically in gold with enamel. Enameling was a great... Um, skill that René Lalique had and brought to the art of jewelry making. And here's a drawing for him. And what it, he would do the drawing, you know, and then he would annotate it uh, for his work people and say, this says, you know, this piece, this is done in blue enamel and this should be this and this should be that. He's giving instructions. You see the wood nymph again appearing in this, ca in this case as a bronze figure which is about this tall, about four feet tall. And this is a, a photograph of René Lalique's stand at the Paris exhibition of 1900, the um, centennial exhibition. And, <clears throat> you know, if you've ever been to a display of jewelry or if you've ever done your own display of jewelry at an exhibition, the problem is that everyone's sort of bent over looking at it, looking down into the case. And, and the other jewelry displays in 1900 had, had that system. But Lalique didn't, didn't go for that. So he, he designs these bronze nymphs. <clears throat> um, and bear in mind, this is a jeweler making a four-foot-tall bronze, the most exquisite bronze you've ever seen. And then he lines them up, and they're joined, the wings, if you like, are very, very fine Lyon lace. And then the jewelry, the pendants, are hung on the lace. So you can walk right up to it, you know, and you're right face-to-face -face with this incredible object. So this is Lalique as, if you like, a merchandiser. He's not just a brilliant designer of the object. He figures out how to sell them as well. 
I mean, this, the ceiling of the stand has got these bats coming down. From, you know, the whole thing would have been just magical to see. This is an allée of pine trees leading up to René Lalique's chateau in Clairefontaine. Again, it's um, a photograph by Lalique, and he loved pine trees. This is another image, another symbol that you find throughout his career in jewelry making and glass making. The pine, the pine cone, the pine branch. Here's another pendant uh, taking that theme. You'll, you'll see very, very few if you like, precious materials in René Lalique's jewelry. He didn't go for precious stones. If there was a big stone, it would be something semi-precious, like a moonstone, or even a piece of glass. You won't see big diamonds or emeralds or rubies or anything like that. He did use gold because it was the most suitable material, but he used other non-precious materials too, including aluminum, which he used for a good deal of his jewelry, particularly stage jewelry. But enamels, and again, the pearl is a Baroque pearl. It's, it's you like Baroque and seed pearls, not the more valuable rounded pearl. Pine cones became the theme of his residence in Paris, and I don't know how many of you have seen this. Has anyone been to Paris and seen these doors? I have. If you haven't, it's something you have to do when you go to Paris. Go to number 40, Cour la Reine, and there are these magnificent doors made of glass installed in 1903. And the pattern is the pine cones from the Allée in Clairefontaine laden with snow. And the, the glass kind of extends into the concrete surrounding the doors, a kind of concrete called beton coigné, which is perfect for the, for, the, uh, for the function. He designed the whole facade of this building. So again, here's, here's a jeweler becoming an architect. And, and this is evidence of René Lalique's extraordinary range of ability. But the building's still there. I've been in there. I've been upstairs to the apartment that he lived in, and beneath it was his atelier, his workshops, his showroom on the main floor. The whole thing was, at one point, the home of Lalique. He died there in 1945. So after the great success of 1900, like I say, René Lalique is this fashionable jeweler. People are following him from all over the world, wealthy people from all over Europe, including crowned heads of Europe, and the wealthiest people in the United States all want a piece of Lalique. So they find him at various exhibitions. They go to Paris and they buy stuff. But he's not satisfied. He wants to do something different. He says that among other things, he's fed up with people copying his jewelry. So he wants a new challenge. Excuse me. Mm. Water tastes good out of that. Um, <clears throat> so he starts designing objects, uh, as you might expect, objects for his clientele, who are all jewelry clients. So he designs these fashionable accessories. Here's a design for and a realized bag highly rare and beautiful objects. And he starts working more and more in glass. He doesn't have a glass works. He doesn't really have the facility to make glass on any significant scale. But you'll see this pine cone chalice, for instance, outside in the gallery. He starts making these and other chalices, some of which, uh, like the one on your uh, right, <clears throat> were unique objects, but others, like the pine cone chalice, was made in series. He started, if you like, mass producing them. How many did he make? He made as many as he could sell, which is the only real answer to how many did Lalique make of anything. Um, but <clears throat> the pinecone chalice is really a turning point, I think, in René Lalique's career. He gradually evolves from a jeweler to a glassmaker by making this series of what you might call objet vertu. And he may have learned the, the appeal of objet vertu from his father, who was a, an objet vertu maker in Paris. Here's René Lalique. He, he loved, as I say, the natural world. He did have specimens, as you can see in this caricature of him, 
from about 1900. He had specimens in his studio. We know that. We see them in photographs. We see an actual stuffed cobra in, on his desk. Um, and, and the specimens that he took, he again, rather like the moth to the flower or the, the, weed, the, the moth to the butterfly or the weed to the flower, he, he was not afraid of what you might call undesirable insect life. Um, he, um, the wasp, for instance, is nobody's favorite. The, the bumblebee is a little romantic and we're kind of okay with bumblebees. They make us honey. Wasps are just nasty little things. But, but René Lalique was okay with them. He saw the beauty in them. And look at this. There is, there is nothing more dramatic than this in A Nouveau jewelry from anybody else. Nothing comes close to this. It's a big hair ornament with a huge moonstone in the middle, these wasps crawling all over it. And you have to imagine this, I think, in something like, say, I don't know, the Paris Opera House, you know, in an evening, an elegant woman with the kind of bun, and that this is stuck in it, and she's standing under a gas light, you know? And the gas light will just bring that to life. I mean, this is what La Belle Epoque is all about, I think. Grasshoppers, also not everyone's favorite, but very much the kind of insect that René Lally saw in his formative years coming from Japan. The Japanese were very happy with grasshoppers. So they find their way into the Art Nouveau school. Emile Gallet used them in glass, as did others, but René Lally loves them. But look at what he's done in this comb. By the way, this is a drawing of a comb. It's not a, it's not a comb. It's a drawing for a comb to be made in horn. He's arranged the grasshoppers in a purely symmetrical pattern, which gives them almost, you might say, an Art Deco appearance, even though this was dating from about 1904 or 5. He loves symmetry. As you can see in this extraordinary pectoral ornament, it's large, it's impressive. Again, the fish are not the most beautiful fish in the world. They're these big bull-headed fish, kind of thing you'd throw back if you caught it right away. Um, but they are sort of Japanese in their appearance. But what has he done? He's arranged them in a purely symmetrical manner to give this unique uh, effect. And he's cast them, by the way, out of glass. Here, here he is, 1902, 1903, 1904, working increasingly in glass. And, and the, one of the great advantages, by the way, of having a symmetrical pattern, you only need to make one mold, you see. And then you can cast and cast and cast. And Lalique understood this. It's very commercial. It's very, it's very smart from that point of view. Fish. Uh, <clears throat> he played with, for the rest of his career, very few, very, very few fish appear in jewelry. Um, but they show up in glass in many different forms. They show up, you can see some on vases in the gallery next door. Uh, you can see some in other forms. Uh, many of them appear on tableware, for instance, which makes sense. Um, here's a favorite one of mine. It's a perch. Again, a perch, a lake perch, is not an exotic fish by any means. It's kind of the weed of the fish world. But here, here it is <clears throat> as one of a range of 30, <clears throat> excuse me, automobile mascots that René Lalique designed between about 1925 and the early 1930s. You'll see some of them outside. The, the Shulman collection includes a very good collection of them. You'll see a few as well, by the way, at the um, nearby um, <clears throat> car museum. Uh, the ones you see in there are also from the Shulman collection, lent by the Museum of Glass. Some of the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, car mascots were made in opalescent glass, as this fish is. Opalescence in glass is a, an ancient technique, which René Lalique certainly did not invent, but I believe exploited it better than anyone else ever did. And they were designed to be mounted onto the hood of a car, which if you think about an automobile from the mid uh, interwar years, they typically have a long hood 
and a prominent radiator cap, and they, these things bolted onto that. And they could be illuminated from beneath, uh, as this one is. So you would be riding along with your <clears throat> Lalique mascot mounted on the top there, sort of leading the way, and it would light up. So imagine at night, you know, speeding through the French countryside with this thing on your hood lit up in colors. You could buy little colored discs that go underneath it between the light source and the ornament, and so you could light it up in your, your favorite color. You'll see this one, both of these next door, Victoire and the Peacock Head. Peacock Head is often, um, not often, but is sometimes found in this blue color, which makes sense, it's peacock blue. Everything Lalique did in terms of its colors, its name, everything has a name, it all makes sense. You know, Victoire is actually a reference to Jacques-Louis David and the victory after the French Revolution of 1789. is a drawing for a, uh, a hand mirror, a very elegant object. Again, an object designed for his jewelry clientele. And here's a bronze of René Lalique. It's a portrait that I think is, it's my favorite portrait of René Lalique, done by his friend Théodore Rivière in about 1905. And you see these portraits, this is, if you like, if Rivière liked you, <clears throat> he would make you a bronze, he was a great sculptor, he'd make you a bronze portrait, you know. And I've seen a few of them all men, and uh, there's one in the Metropolitan in New York, some dignitary, and he's standing there, this guy, in his, in his best outfit. You know, he's got his like, cravat, and beautiful suit, and all that. They're about, they're about this big, 14 inches. René Lalie, and I'm sure he chose this, is modeled in a smock coat, which is the coat of a worker, an ouvrier. You know, he's modeled as an artisan. And I'm sure when he and Riviere were talking about this, Lalique chose this because he knew this was permanent. This is forever and ever our man. You're going to see this bronze of him. This is how he wanted to be thought of. This is how he wants to be remembered. There's that realized object from the drawing you saw. And again, it's not just two. It's a flock of swallows which are caught in that, and this happens occasionally with swallows, very, very rarely, one day of the year, they'll flock, you know, and they'll feed together and bang. And how do you capture that? Photography. The only way to capture that other than that is in photography. Lally took a photograph of that, or had a photograph of that phenomenon. And here it is rendered in molded glass on the back of a mirror, amazing thing. We're up to about 1905 now, and still René Lalique hasn't stopped making glass uh, on any significant scale. We're in the Museum of Glass. I promise you I'm going to talk about glass. I am. <laughs> and this is really when it starts. Um, this is a painting on the left of the Coty um, store, the Coty shop, perfumery on the Place Vendôme. There's the Place Vendôme, the historic Louis XIV Place in Paris, which is still the center of the French luxury industry and was then in 1905. René Lalique's store was next door to the Coty store. So he meets this guy, Francois Coty. Uh, Coty was a um, very, very different person <coughs> from Lalique, excuse me. He was uh, <coughs> a little younger. He was highly ambitious, ruthless, five foot two, originated, he was born in Corsica. He identified with Napoleon and had many of the same features. Um, believed he was descended from Napoleon. But then again, everyone born in Corsica believes they're descended from Napoleon. Um, but he, like Napoleon, came to Paris with big ideas, big objectives to, to build an empire, in his case, it was an empire of perfume, and he did it. And he did it largely with uh, René Lalique's help. From the very beginning of their meetings, he engaged Lalique to design for him. Lalique was this highly elegant, highly regarded designer in Paris, not known for anything to do with perfume, but Cody saw it. 
And he starts designing objects for Francois Coty. He designs some glass objects, but the first things are actually paper. Um, in those days, perfume was sold in typically a rather plain bottle, but the label was kind of decorative, and Lalique was good at designing them. This one was for Dorsey. Well, that's Francois Coty, but he starts designing them for a number of different uh, French perfumers. This you may recognize if you look in the gallery next door. There's a, there's a box full of early Coty fragrances, a little tester box. On the back of the box inside the lid is this little bronze plaque. <clears throat> it doesn't look like much, but René Lalique designed that. This is it. It is an absolutely superb piece of sculpture, sculptural work, just on a little commercial box. But this is how good he was, and this is what he, the standards that he was prepared to work to. And these early Coty bottles made um, from about 1908, 9, 10, and made in, for the first time, René Lalique's own glassworks. He opens a glassworks uh, just outside of Paris, near Fontainebleau, in a place called Cumleville, and he um, starts making glass there. It's not a, it's not a high-end glassworks. It's not modern. You can only make relatively small things there. But look at the quality of this perfume bottle. That shows you front and back, made around 1909, 1910. Um, did you own one of these, Stephen? <laughs> there you go. Um, one of the rarest perfume bottles ever. In the realm of collecting, perfume bottles is a great way to go. There are several hundred of them that René Lalique designed through his lifetime. Some of them are easy to find. You can find those that were made in large quantities for firms like Worth relatively easily, <clears throat> even if they were made in the 20s or 30s. But some of them, like this one, and many of the ones that you see next door in the gallery are not only exquisitely designed, but also exquisitely rare and exquisitely expensive, too. But they are the best perfume bottles ever made. It's a great way to go. I've only ever met two people who tried to collect all of the perfume bottles that René Lalique designed. Um, and maybe three if we count the Shulmans. You tried, right? Um, but some people, that's all they collected, and they went for it. And, and it's relatively easy today to find out how many he designed and what, because there is a catalogue raisonné of Lalique, which has been around for 20, 25 years now, gets updated occasionally, and it shows you at least a photograph or, or, of the original design or the actual object. And you can use that to trace, you know, how many you've got. Coty's empire extended throughout the world. He had stores in various parts of Europe. Uh, he had a big store on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, which is still there. It was until recently the headquarters of Henry Bendel on 55th and 5th. And the windows, three stories of windows facing Fifth Avenue are by René Lalique. They were designed in 1912 and installed in 1913, and they are, as I say, still there. Beautifully restored, I must say. So that if you come to New York, it's something to see. After René Lalique's own house, Atelier in Paris, this is the best you'll see of Lalique architectural window glass. There's the factory in Cum La Ville. And I love this drawing. To me, this is one of the most important of all René Lalique's drawings. And there are thousands of them, by the way. And it's perhaps the most important drawing in many respects in the realm of decorative arts of the period. You know, if you know anything of Art Nouveau and Art Deco, two consecutive movements, people sometimes say, well, Art Nouveau, it's all like, you know, naturalistic and organic. And then Art Deco, it's all stylized and geometric. Well, there's an element of, of truth in that, speaking as the author of a book called Art Deco, I can tell you. But it's not that simple, obviously. But look at this drawing. 
René Lalique has drawn the aster on the side of the paper, the FK Reeve parchment paper. He's drawn it as a natural flower, you see? And then just a few centimeters across, and who knows, maybe a few minutes later, he's drawn it as a stylized geometric flower. He's kind of worked it out. This was done in about 1909. Now, when we talk of Art Deco, most people say, well, it's from the 20s or it's after World War I. This is 1909, 10 years before the Treaty of Versailles. So um, René Lalique is clearly so far ahead of his time. He, the Aster does appear on, among other things, this bottle that was finally realized as a natural flower. And it appears on other designs at the same time, including the one that I've been passing around and I hope I will get that back. Where is it? Does someone have that? Susan. Um, it appears on that too, as a natural flower. But Lalique was drawn uh, from a design perspective to the symmetrical flower. And many flowers do have natural symmetry within them. And increasingly, he starts using flora with natural symmetry within his range. You'll see this one next door, the big, the big impressive blown vase, something he couldn't possibly have made, by the way, at the Cumlaville factory. It wasn't until a new factory was opened 100 years ago uh, in Alsace that you could make this. You need big machines for this and lots of hot blowing technique. But this vase, and there's one next door, it looks like a sort of abstract geometric flower, but those are natural flowers. Those are poppy heads, just rendered completely naturally. But arranged, as he did with the crickets earlier, in a, almost an abstract pattern to give it that appearance, a beautiful object. We'll see that again later. You'll see this next door, too. You see one side of it. It's a medallion. If you see the other side, um, which I'll show you in a moment, this was Lalique's announcement that he's now a glassmaker. In November of 1912, uh, René Lalique starts an exhibition and he, he has an opening for it in December at his gallery on the Place Vendôme and it's all glass. Up until then, he's been a jeweler. He's 52 now and he's having for the first time a glass exhibition. There's been glass appearing in his store periodically but now, it's all glass. And what does he do? He sends this medallion to his clients. He comes in a little box. You get it, you know, delivered. Or you open it up, and there's this exquisite little round glass medallion. And it says, you know, come to my exhibition in the Place Vendôme. I'm, it basically says, I'm now a glassmaker. In the past, by the way, he had sent an invitation to his clients in the 1890s engraved on an ivory plaque. And later on in the mid 1920s, he sends invitations made of plastic, molded from plastic, new material he's, he's playing with. But right now he's saying, I'm a glass maker now, come visit, come and see my glass. And if you went, you might have seen this vase that was in that exhibition, uh, the big one with the sort of stylized frogs on the shoulder. This, this is a um, impressive vase, very difficult to make at the time. It would have been a great accomplishment to make this in Vingen, um, in um, <clears throat> Kumlaville. But he did it and then he cast these green glass frogs and sort of stuck them on top. He also starts at this time making glass in a technique that we call sear perdu or lost wax. The covered vase with the frog on top is made in that technique. And you can see a couple of pieces next door again in the Schulman collection of Sir Perdu glass. And the way you make it, um, and I'll show you this cast glass model of a cougar in Sir Perdu. The way you make it is you, um, you carve, first of all, a model of the object. And René Lelic would carve this himself in most cases, not always. Uh, Auguste Ledru did some too. 
Well, you carve this out of wax, and then you would encase the wax in a mold of plaster of Paris. Plaster of Paris sets around it, so you've got this sort of block, and then you drill a hole and you steam into that hole, which melts the wax, and the wax runs off, hence the term lost wax. And you end up with a block, plaster of Paris, with a void inside it in the form that you want to make. Now, if you're making this cast glass cougar, cougars, by the way, Lalit was fascinated with them. Here's one carved in horn on a necklace 20 years earlier, but here's a fabulous one from 1919. But you just pour the glass in, and then you break open the mold, <clears throat> and there it is, all being well. Uh, hence, uh, the thing is unique. You can only make it once. If you want to make a hollow object like the vase that we just saw, you blow the glass into the mold, and it finds its way into the corners, into the edges of the mold, and every crevice, and then you um, break the mold. And, and that gives you the opportunity, by the way, of making designs that you couldn't make any other way in molding. You can kind of undercut with Siopadu casting. And some of Lalique's greatest achievements were in Siopadu. There's a few hundred of them that are recorded. He did sell them. He used them really as um, exhibition pieces to show basically how great he was as a, as a glassmaker and craftsman as well. This big blue vase was in that exhibition, too. Uh, very few of these are recorded. I think we've seen three of them over the years. And it's a, it's a blue body which has these depressions in it. And then what Lalique has done is take <clears throat> a cast glass element, clear glass, and set it into the body. And then in between the cast glass element and the blue is a layer of uh, foil reflecting metal foil. And this gives the object a kind of a, a presence, you know, it glows whenever any light, it, refra it refracts and reflects light. And this is a technique that René Lalique used in, particularly in his early glass making, and uniquely so. Nobody else did this. He kind of used it in jewelry and he translated it into glass making. This big vase is a tour de force. Um, and the little perfume bottle next to it, which as you can see is the same shape, he would often make something on one scale and then again on another. And the Lely companies still do that. You know, you can buy vases and little tiny ones and great big ones, all the same model. Once you've got the mold, you see, you can reduce it easily enough using a kind of caliper system, which Lely used as a jeweler. And he used it as a glassmaker too. So this little bottle, which is called Four Suns, another great um, Lalique perfume, uh, has these reflecting lens-like panels. They're, con they're convex, set in, that just glow in the light. But it's the same body as that. Here's another perfume with the same technique. In this case, it's an oval panel. The glass in the panel is clear glass. The whole thing is clear here. There's no colored glass here. It's a clear glass panel set against gold metal foil. And the bottle itself is clear glass, but it's been painted, finished with a green, what Lally called patine or patina, kind of enamel that's painted on the surface in cold state, which again, really warms it up and brings it to life, you know? This is another early bottle one of the best <clears throat> with these panels on both sides. Yeah, again, it's not an easy thing to make. It's a rather expensive thing to make, although he figured out how to do it as inexpensively as possible and how to mass produce these. But look how elegant that is for a commercial perfume model. And commercial perfumes became a very big part of René Lalique's empire after about 1910, 1912, they're really the most, that, that's what he, he's making the most of. He's got Coty, he's got Dorsey, and soon he's got a dozen other French and other perfumers that he's designing bottles and other perfume accessories for. You'll see many of them outside. And he's also begins designing 
his own perfume bottles that he can sell in his store. This uh, rather exquisite one, again, there's one next door in green, was made just for La Ligue. So you, you bought it and you could take it home and look at it or fill it with perfume. The little pendant one is rather nice, I think. You wear it around your neck. It's almost like an ancient world thing. Uh, this was a great age of travel. And having a little pendant perfume that you could carry with you easily, Lalique thought of that, a great accessory. I particularly like this one that's shaped as a poppy. The whole thing is the head of a poppy, you know? Again, clear glass with painted detail on it and a little black glass up for the stamen. He liked to do that. The little object I passed around, you'll see that. It has patina and it has enamel on it. Two different cold finishing techniques. And this perfume making uh, continued throughout Lalique's career and indeed throughout the history of the Lalique company. If you step into the lobby, you can buy a modern Lalique perfume bottle. They still make many of them, <clears throat> including, by the way, many perfume bottles still made today, made in Lalique's old factory, designed by René Lalique. So there's still lots of that. And indeed, much of what the Lalique company makes today <clears throat> was designed by René Lalique, which again is a great testament to his ability and his legacy. You'll see one of these outside, the Lucien Lelong bottle, 1929, made for the American market. The American market becomes much more important for the Lalique company uh, after about 1925. The 1925 Paris exhibition was a huge commercial hit for Lalique. <clears throat> and Americans are influenced by it. Um, they come back, they start building things like the, the Chrysler building in the style of the Paris exhibition of 1925, style that we now call Art Deco. But this is, um, this is inspirational. And of course, America is the market. America and American consumerism is by far the biggest potential for French luxury industries at this time. So they all look to America uh, for their marketplace. The department store is a big part of that. I love this bottle, which Lalique did reproduce fairly recently by a new one. It's cased, of course, not in cardboard as most of them are. Lalique put this in a metal case, you know, to to really talk to the concept of the Chrysler building and the industrial age, the motor age, the age of steel. You'll see this clock next door too. And to me, this is a, another tour de force of René Lalique designing. Bear in mind that the factory he built in 19... 21 opened in 1922 in Alsace, which is still there where all Lally glass is made. He and his son, Mark, designed much of the automated machinery that was used in there and is still used in there today. There's not that much that has changed. And this was the modern age. You know, if you look around, you go to the hot shop, what are most glassmakers doing? They're making things in an artisanal way. What the hotshot people are making, and they're immensely talented at it, look at this, they're using techniques that are thousands of years old in some cases. I watched um, <clears throat> Ben make a goblet in the hotshot today and we talked about it and I said, you, you know, you're really making something like the Romans did and he agreed. It's not that different. René Lalique didn't want that. He didn't want to be a glass artisan. He'd learned, I think, from Emile Gallet that being a kind of hand craftsman, artisan, led to a lot of problems, a lot of wastage, very difficult to get things right. From the very beginning, René Lalique, who had a tradition of being an artisanal jeweler, said, I'm going to make glass using machinery. I'm going to make machinery glass. I'm going to mass produce my glass. This is the modern way to do it. 
<clears throat> but he devised ways to use machinery in a way that nobody else had ever done or arguably will do again. Look at this clock. The, it's a plaque of glass. It's a press molded piece of glass. It's a single plaque with a hole in the middle to put the movement in. It fits onto this bronze base. But how has he made it? It's pressed in a mold. You make it by pulling a lever, basically. But the female figure is molded in relief. And the male figure is molded into the glass in intaglio. So he becomes light and she becomes dark with transmitted light. It's called the night and day clock. And what better way to represent that? He did it earlier in jewelry, this famous piece of jewelry called the kiss. The male figure is molded outwardly in relief and she is, ma is molded into the glass, giving it a unique perspective. It's glass, it's just another, another little molded plaque of glass. Again, made by pulling a lever. There's nothing complicated about making this. But have you ever seen a more beautiful piece of glass jewelry than that? Or for that matter, a more elegant clock. So a good deal of Lalique is about, is about technique. By the way, I've seen people who tried to collect every clock that René Lalique designed. Again, by the time this clock was made in about 1926, virtually anything that could be made in glass, René Lalique was making it. He was making little pieces of glass jewelry. He was making architectural glass on a vast scale and everything in between. Um, collecting Lally clocks, by the way, I think there's about 30 of them. It's not that difficult. It's not easy, but it's less of a challenge than, say, collecting all the perfume bottles or all the vases. This is the best of the clocks. Tableware, table glass of all types, large, impressive pieces like this big, blue deep dish uh, is another great way to collect René Lalique and a rather affordable one. This is not an affordable piece, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not crazy, a few thousand dollars. And again, Lalique has used the opalescent technique to really bring the butterflies to life in the same way as the moths and butterflies overlapping again in a moment, a millisecond of time were carved in horn. But again, this is a pressed glass object with some relief on the center, some intaglio around the cavetta, around the rim, and a most extraordinary result. Moths and butterflies here in a box and a cachet, a little letter seal. Boxes, which of course are Dressing table accessories, there's a beautiful display next door of the, the dressing table in the 20s, you know, everything that the sort of elegant woman needed to have. And that would include Lalique perfume bottles, Lalique mirror, Lalique this, Lalique that, and a little Lalique box for powder uh, or for cream. What's he done here? He's used one of his favorite subjects, the moth, the papillon de nuit, and he's arranged them symmetrically. And these are molded in relief coming out of the surface of the, of the box. And if you turn it over, the bodies of them are molded in relief on the underside too. So that the whole thing has just a complete natural feel. An exquisite thing, this, 1911, 1912. Beautifully done. Clear glass, finished in a sepia patina that just enriches the whole thing. And the little object next to it, also clear glass, patinated, is about an inch and a half, two inches high. It's a little tiny letter seal on what's called the matrix underneath you would engrave your monogram and then you'd use it to seal in wax, you know, your correspondence. Still fairly common uh, up to World War II. Again, there are scores of these. I don't know how many letter seals there are, 50 maybe, I'm trying to collect all of them. But look how beautiful it is. He's captured the butterfly. Just, you know, that millisecond where the thing lands on a leaf? There it is. It's there and it's gone. And Lalique's got it. He's captured it. He's preserved it. Tableware, 
is the most common thing in La Ligue. They were, they were producing thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of pieces of tableware between the wars. Drinking glasses, decanters, plates and bowls especially. And these can be found. Most of them are in clear glass, some in opalescent. Uh, this is a nice way to go. Um, I have a table service of Lali glass at home that we use on a regular basis. And they're not expensive. If you're going to have a glass, you know, have a good one, right? <laughs> Cheers. Well, I love these. And as you can see in this photograph, <clears throat> they're designed, as the perfume bottles are, by the way, to look best when they have their contents in them. So if you have La Ligue de Canter, put some red wine in it or put something in it to bring it up. This photograph, uh, my auction company took that from a collection that we sold a few years ago from one gentleman who tried to collect every piece of La Ligue drinking glass, that there were every design. And again, there's hundreds of them. And he got pretty close. I love these little drinking glasses. They have two little men on them. See that? Two little wine presses on them, just going at it, you know. And the, the decanter, the inside, it's concave on both sides. So the, the flower head in the center, the, the sunflower in the center, is pinched together so it's clear, you know. So you see the, the liquid around the outside, like an aura. Very clever. One of my favorite themes, and something that, a theme that people do collect exclusively in La Ligue is birds. La Ligue loved birds, and birds of all types. Especially, I would say, the more common bird, the birds that he saw around him in the French countryside, <clears throat> or in Paris, perhaps. Here's a pair of um, doves. And again, everything La Ligue did make sense. This is a rather strange object. I believe it's, it's, it represents love. It's perhaps a wedding thing, a marriage thing. Love birds. And what are they on? It's a huge egg. You know, it's a huge egg. It's a symbol of fertility. It's a symbol of all good things. And again, what's he done? He's made it in opalescent glass, which is um, so effective with birds. Look at this. Um, a bowl where the birds, parakeets in this case, are arranged symmetrically in a frieze around the border. And they're made in opalescent glass. Now opalescence is present in the glass, of course, in the body at the same, in the same um, uh, density throughout the glass. So wherever the glass is thicker, the opalescence will be stronger. And Lalique understood this and molded his designs accordingly, so here the birds just come really to life <clears throat> by being um, molded in bold relief and opalescent accordingly. I love that bowl, bowl perruche. If you've been, been to Paris, you know, sitting on the edge of the Bois de Boulogne here, there, there are these little birds that come down and they sit on, in the cafes, and they're sparrows, the most common bird. The ones in Paris are, I suspect, the best fed sparrows in the world because they eat the bits of croissant and everything that you leave. Lalique saw them too. He saw them and he would have sat in, in those cafes that you sit in, and he didn't, he didn't just see them, he, he modeled them. I think that René Lalique's sparrows, the moineau, are in many ways some of the most beautiful bird sculptures ever created. They are actual size. Um, he designed, I think there's five or six different poses of these things. You know, he wasn't satisfied just making one sparrow, five or six of them, get them all in there. And when you find a really nice old one from the 20s, it's just a beautiful little object to have in your hand. You know, beautifully molded, really alive little thing. And these were relatively inexpensive. They still make them, but the modern ones just don't have the same appeal as the old one. I'll just finish up with a few vases because we see so many great vases in the Shulman collection next door. 
Um, I love this one. It's an early one. It's called courge, and these pepper plants are, are sort of molded in relief. But look at the way some of them have the natural frosted finish on the outside, and some of them he's polished to give a perspective to the hanging of the plants on the tree. And he's also decorated the background in this patina, which gives it more perspective. Again, it's just a blue vase, but he's done everything he can to bring the flowers into life, give them more uh, depth. This one, which is basically a bubble of glass, you know, and any, any glass vessel that is a bubble, like this one, the, where the neck is the smaller part of the body, they're made by blowing glass into a mold, a hot metal mold. You don't, you don't have some guy like Ben downstairs blowing the glass through a tube. You can't do that. It's done by blowing hot air in an automated process. They, they have a hot air tube and they put it into the top of the mold and vertically mounted mold and, boom, and it blows the glass in, the gather of glass, fills the mold, they open it up, and this is like three or four guys doing it. It's a big, heavy process. They open it up, they take out the hot thing, and they put it into the annealing oven. It's, it's a very, very sophisticated process, um, highly mechanical, an absolute mesmerizing thing to watch. I've watched them do it many times at the factory. But that's really the only way to make this, is with a big heavy metal mold and a highly sophisticated factory. This is one reason, by the way, why Lalique is rarely copied or faked. Something like this, at least. <clears throat> because to make this, you need a factory. You know, whereas other glass that you make artisanally, that you blow in relatively rudimentary conditions, glass made by people like, I know, Tiffany or Calais or, or even people making downstairs. If you have those conditions, you can replicate it. Um, and those conditions are not hard to find. A sophisticated factory, you, you can't find that. So, so mold blowing was a big part of what Lalique did at the new factory. But a vase like this, and again, you'll see a great one next door, famous Lalique vase called Bacante, best made, I've always thought, in opalescence. <clears throat> you can only make this by pressing it. You can't blow this. This is made by forcing the glass into a metal mold, vertically placed metal mold, three or four parts to it, and you force the glass in, you push it in with a plunger, and then the plunger retracts. You know? So the, the top of the vase has to be the widest part. And you'll see a number of vases like this, um, mostly made in the 1930s. It was more economical to make it this way in the 1930s was a time of more pressure that way. But uh, an absolutely incredible piece of design this, which I believe could almost work at any level. This is René Lalique as a sculptor, and you, know, you could make this on the frieze of a building and it would be magnificent. Or as a little piece of jewelry, equally magnificent. Tableware again, a plate, with dogs on it, arranged in a symmetrical pattern and finished with patina. Just a simple thing. The plates were very easy to make. He actually blew them. You blow the plates into a mold that looks like a big die, like a big cube, you know? So there's five of them, one on the face, four sides, blow it in, and then you cut them out. Very, very clever. Brilliant piece of Lalique work. And a box, beautiful box. Again, smooth on the outside, the dragonflies overlapping, millisecond of time, molded on the inside in relief. Um, such an elegant object. Collecting boxes, nice way to go. I've only ever met one person who tried to collect every single box that René Lalique designed. And he got pretty close. Um, that was the only thing he collected. I think there were two or three by the time he stopped collecting that he didn't have.
And I'll, I'll leave you with this slide, ladies and gentlemen, because to me it shows the brilliance of Lalique both as a jeweler and as a glassmaker, and, a, a, addressing more or less the same subject. It also shows the brilliance of Lalique as a modeler of the uh, human form, the female form here, in the pendant on the left and the classic figure of Suzanne from 1925 on its illuminated base. And what I'd like to say is perhaps, Susan, I can have that object back and I'll talk a little about that. But um, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. But time, there's plenty of time. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them if I can. Thank you. Any questions? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons why things are not signed. The most common reason being they're not Lalique and they're somebody else. Sometimes the signature is hard to find or it's been removed for some reason. But if you talk to me afterwards and maybe show me pictures and things, I'd be very happy to help you. That's very easy to do. But almost everything is signed. Um, but there are reasons why the signature may not be easy to find. Mm -hmm. I will, I will tell you that there are a very large number of pieces that are signed Lalique or a Lalique, which are not Lalique. So a signature is the last thing you use to authenticate an object. And an appraiser does not authenticate, as you know, uh, and I'm on the board of the uh, AAA, by the way. So I do that too. But it's, um, it's very easy to take a piece of glass and put Lalique on the bottom. And we see a great deal of that. So I wouldn't use the signature to authenticate the object. The way you can identify Lalique, whether it's correct or not, is by um, looking at the catalog resume, seeing if it conforms with something in that. <clears throat> but basically what I tell people is, and this applies to anything, that you're trying to authenticate through a signature or a mark, you don't let the signature authenticate the object. You let the object authenticate the signature. See what I mean? So you look at all the qualities of the object. Is this good enough to be Lalique? Is this good enough to be Lalique? Well, yeah, of course it is. Look at that. It's exquisite. It's molded on two sides, on relief, in relief on the inside, intaglio on the outside. It's finished in two ways, patina on there, enamel in the middle. So that's good enough to be Lalique. Oh, yeah, it says Lalique on the bottom. That's, that's the way to do it. By the way, beautiful object, right? What, what is it? Does anyone know? Well, that's what it's called, but what is it? Does anyone know what it is? When you're a glassmaker, you don't just say, let's make a little bowl and sell it. You know? You, you go into, a, I don't know, Bed Bath & Beyond, and everything has a function, doesn't it? You know, if you want a mixing bowl, there's a mixing bowl. If you want a salad bowl, there's a salad bowl. You want a soup bowl, you want a cereal bowl. You don't make something and say, let's try and sell this little bowl. Um, this is a finger bowl, okay? I'm sure you all use finger bowls on a regular basis. <laughs> but <clears throat> uh, if you were an elegant French family in 1912 when this was designed, a finger bowl would be a, a table accessory. But think about that. It's a finger bowl. That's all it is. And Lalique designed dozens of finger bowls, okay? He wasn't satisfied with just one, even though this one is, uh, is there anything better than that in a finger bowl? Any other questions? Sir?
Uh, the question is, how did the enterprise survive, particularly through the Depression? And he, he made an investment after World War I. <clears throat> this was the primary investment in a new factory in Alsace. But if you know your French geography, Alsace was retrieved from German occupation after World War I, and there was a tremendous incentive to establish your company there, incentive in the form of financial incentives from the French government. So I don't know all the details of that, but as I understand it, um, he was able to do that quite successfully from an economic perspective. As far as manufacturing the um, materials, the, the, um, the equipment, the plant, yeah, that wasn't easy. That would have been a significant investment, but I believe a good deal of that was also supported by the French governmental um, um, base. Now, during the Depression, yes, everyone suffered. If you're a French luxury industry, you tended to suffer. La Ligue had the advantage of an extremely good, well-established distribution network in the United States through department stores. And La Ligue was not outrageously expensive. So people were still buying finger bowls and table glass and all sorts of things. And then there were other projects. The Normandie, the world's biggest luxury liner, was fitted out with Lalique. He, he, um, they survived the Depression. They did make things a lot more economically. There was more mass production. They cut a few corners. Um, but they did fine. The, the biggest problem for Lalique was after the war in the 50s and 60s. René Lalique had died. His son and then ultimately his granddaughter were running it. They did not have um, a great marketplace. They relied on the, um, the Ricci family, the family of Nina Ricci and her father, Robert Ricci, who um, was a great patron of Lalique and supporter and friend of the family. He uh, financed the business to a large extent, and they moved into uh, perfume in a big way. Perfume was a big part of what they did. Perfume kept them going through the Depression, too. Any other questions? Uh, yes, at the back, ma'am. Uh, those are good questions. You know, these days, where do you see it? There are very few places you can go to see it at, I know, an antique shop, you know? There are very, very few stores, certainly in the United States or in Europe, that carry Lalique on a regular basis. There's a couple in Paris in the flea market, and that's about it. You see it at auction. There, are, there have been three major auctions of Lalique in the last three days. Um, one of them I ran. And you find it at auction. So at an auction, an auction, the one I ran was in Dallas, the one yesterday was in New York, and the one before that was somewhere in England. But it's international. So it doesn't really matter where it is anymore. So where do you find it? Um, where do you see fakes? You see fakes uh, everywhere. You see fakes on eBay. eBay is a lovely place to find. If you want to see fake Lalique, it's a great place to find fakes. And you find fakes um, in many places. You know, sometimes a, a really, really good fake will slip through a good auction unnoticed. An outrageous fake won't, of course. But as I said earlier, there are actually not that many fakes. Most fakes are easy to spot because they are very inferior glass that someone has just written Lalique on. And, and you can tell pretty easily. Um, he was a Christian throughout his life. He was born that way and maintained that throughout his life. And I believe that later in his life, he turned more to his faith. Uh, and you can see evidence of that in that he starts designing and manufacturing religious glass. Not, not a lot of it, but glass for religious consumption. He doesn't have to do that. You know, it's not a big market. 
but he made some crucifixes. There's a wonderful one, by the way, in the, um, in the National um, Cathedral in Washington. There's an entire church designed by Lalique on the interior on the Isle of Jersey in the British Channel Islands. And you could buy small religious objects. Um, so I believe he turned more to that. His tomb in Père Lachaise Cemetery in, in Paris has a beautiful Dali glass cross on the outside of the tomb. But he was not overtly religious in any way, no. Pleasure. Yes. Yeah, they were all signed, more or less. You know, to answer this lady's question, almost everything was signed. The only exception to that, a lot of the architectural panels and that are not, but virtually every object is signed. Yeah, that'd be nicely signed on the, on the, ins on the middle of the base. Signed in the same way this is. All right? Well, uh, yes, ma'am. There's two different ways of doing it today. Some are stamped. Uh, mostly they are engraved. It's kind of the last stage of the production process, the sort of final quality control process. Someone at the very end takes it, looks it over, signs it with a, like a dentist drill, and then it's shipped off. Most of them are signed that way. Well, it was not considered to be signed by him, even though it says Allah. He didn't do it. He didn't sign it himself. He had some guy doing that. Um, he liked to put his signature on things, but it's not like a painting where the guy did it and signed it. Okay. I thank you all, ladies and gentlemen.